Well, hey everyone, and um, welcome to another NIREX webinar. We are very excited to start our 2022 webinar series with a really interesting topic with Dr. David Boas, I believe who needs no introduction. Um, this is a two-part webinar. Today's talk will focus on the practical setup and uh, how to do a high-density FNES measurement. Alex will talk about that later. Um, we are NIREX um, and we like the idea to keep ourselves at the forefront of innovation. And it is indeed a great, great privilege to be a part of today's webinar. Um, my name is Mahipal. I'm a scientific consultant here at our Berlin office. Alongside with me are my colleagues, Amy, uh, Alina, who have been working really hard to bring this webinar to us, uh, organizing all sorts of stuff in the background. So thanks, Amy and Alina, for that. Um, we are also joined today with um, by Dr. Alexander von Lumen, who is our scientific director of research and development. Um, if you have done some bit of FNES, you must have heard his name, um, has a strong background of engineering FNES technology and integrating it with other cool modalities. So um, I will point to some of the webinar considerations. So everybody will be muted, uh, but of course we love to hear from you. So questions are welcomed at any time. Please use the Zoom chat. Um, we will sort the questions, put them together in a document. And at the end of the webinar, we'll ask Dr. Boas those questions. Um, this webinar will be recorded and the, uh, the video will be available on our website in the coming days. Of course, um, if we are not able to answer all the questions, if the questions are very specific, then um, we will write to you. Um, if, if you have any other the questions, if you need more information, um, please do write to us at this email address, consulting at nirex.net. Okay, that's it um, for the technicalities. Uh, let me now invite Alex um, to, to introduce our speaker, to introduce the topic. Alex, the stage is yours. Thanks, my pal. I will also try to keep it short. I think everybody is here to, to listen to David. Uh, very warm yeah. welcome also from me. So um, I think everyone that attended the last FNUS conference knows that the field has a lot of hot topics currently and many exciting developments are on the horizon. And obviously one of those hot topics is high density or diffuse optical tomography. It's a domain that actually kind of seems to undergo quite some revival, it was initially explored in the early 2000s by a few pioneers, among others, David. But mm -hmm. now with uh, new instruments and methods and computational power, it seems that we're approaching a time in which actually every researcher with an appropriate FNIRS device can do high density or DOT FNIRS. And why is that cool? Why are we really excited about this? Well, it uh, shows the real potential to improve spatial resolution and depth and lateral specificity in FNIR signals and uh, yields a very, um, very interesting, nice, uh, you know, visuals uh, because it enables tomographic reconstruction of cerebral activation. So yielding images like you would otherwise see in cortical fMRI. So there are some careful considerations that have to be made in trade-offs um, regarding dynamic range and sample rate and all those Things. Um, NIREX will release a new version of Aurora and NIRSight this year that will add some additional features um, that kind of are relevant in this domain. But yes, as initially said before talking much more about this, I will stop because who could better tell you um, much about high density than our guest, Dr. David Bohr. So David, I'm really excited that you're here. I'm gonna briefly do the intro um, with your background and then I'm gonna hand it over to you. So. Um, for everyone who doesn't know, um, David received his bachelor's in physics at uh, Rensselaer Polytech uh, Polytechnic Institute and his PhD um, in physics at UPenn, uh, was a professor at radiology at Harvard Medical School and the director of the Martinus Optics Division at MGH in Boston, and is now the professor at the Biomedical Engineering Department of Boston University as a director of the Neurophotonic Center of Boston University. David's also 
uh, the founding president of the Society of Ethnics and the founding editor in chief of the journal Neurophotonics, published by SPIE. And at BU, they runs the BOAS lab, the Bio Optical and Acoustic Spectroscopy Lab, where I also personally had the great pleasure to work under him as a postdoc before joining NEREX. It was a lot of fun. Um, but there's a lot more stuff to say, uh, great things. But I think, on the other hand, everybody probably knows already um, the name and what is attached to, to David's name. So um, without further ado, we're very happy to have you here, David. And um, I'm going to hand over to you. The stage is yours. Great. Um, excellent. So thanks so much uh, for the introduction, Alex, and uh, uh, everyone at NEREX for uh, you know, making this webinar possible. I'm, I'm kind of excited to share with everyone um, my long history of trying to do high density FNIRs, and um, I'm now able to do it actually in large part thanks to Alex and NEREX. So I'm very much grateful for that. So I'll tell you my story of how we finally got to be able to do a high density FNIRs. Um, and uh, uh, as some background initially, you know, maybe 30 minutes or so, and then then we'll um, get into uh, how to how 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 to do it, um, uh, which we'll start with today by designing a high density probe in Atmosphere. Um, and then um, next month we'll we'll see the data that was collected with the NEREX uh, NSP2 system using the probe that we will design today and, and then we'll analyze it, Homer and Atlas here. <clears throat> so, all right, first, let me just tell you about some history. So uh, actually the um, first FNIRS system or first near system I built actually was with Andy Siegel, um, who was a fantastic analog electrical engineer, um, my first PhD student. Um, he was quite outstanding and he built our first continuous wave imaging system. Had um, uh, eight, 18 lasers, um, two different wavelengths, so nine different source positions, had 16 photodiodes. So this was actually a, a, a tomographic imaging system. You know, we designed it to do high density measurements. And actually um, my friend, David Benaron is a neonatologist, um, was a neonatologist at Stanford. He was excited that we had built this system and he invited us out um, to Stanford Medical um, uh, um, Hospital and we made measurements on premature infants. So this is um, this device in, in probably 1999, 2000. And we, um, uh, uh, these are premature infants, not many stimuli you can give them, but we passively just move their arm up and down. Um, and we were able to see activation of the motor sensory cortex as we move the infant's arm. So this was actually my first measurements of brain activity. Um, and it was a high density system. We would sequentially turn on each source and detector and measure from um, each source and then measure from all detectors. Um, worked well in these premature infants, but you know, in adults, we couldn't make measurements because the uh, sensitivity of the system wasn't good enough. Um, so we really wanted to make measurements in adults, uh, and so we had to um, build more sensitive instruments. So there's Andy Siegel. He's building our, our prototype system with more sensitive detector. Um, we started in, uh, working with TechN, a uh, contract engineering company, and they took our circuit boards and put them into nice boxes for us. Um, and then built, this was our fourth generation imaging system, and then they built which we published about a dozen different studies with. And a few years later, then we built our fifth generation imaging system um, and we published over 50 papers with that system. Um, and so we were doing sparse measurements of brain activity uh, with these systems, um, and, uh, but then we wanted to move to high density. Now. So I'll just give you a little bit of background on that. So first, in a, actually, uh, we this is the, fifth generation system, but our first measurements I'm going to show you actually were with a fourth generation system. Um, you know, we frequency encoded the lasers, we have the ad avalanche photodiodes, um, and we, we just kind of bandpass filtered and got, we were able to measure the signals from all the lasers from all the detectors simultaneously. So in theory, one could do high density measurements. Um, in practice, that was challenging. Um, and we just started off with low density measurements. So basically, um, we what we often did would just have an array of uh, like four sources here in a row <clears throat> and it's detectors three centimeters apart. And we would only measure, um, you know, these three centimeter channels 
and we had no overlapping measurements. But nonetheless, um, you know, then and for and even today, the vast majority of FNIRS measurements are using low density probes like this, and you can measure, you know, brain activity quite nicely. This was Maria Franceschini's work, um, where she was just showing finger opposition, uh, a finger um, a motor task. Uh, a sensory task of the fingers and an electrical uh, uh, stimulation to the median nerve um, and showing the localized increases in oxyhemoglobin and decreases in deoxyhemoglobin. Okay, so that's not high density. Okay, but so why do we want high density? <clears throat> we want to improve spatial resolution. And so how do we do that? Well, the high density measurements allows us to get overlapping measurements. Um, and so every point in space in the brain now is gonna be measured by multiple pairs of sources and detectors. Um, and through the image reconstruction procedure that allows us to um, improve our spatial resolution, get better spatial uniformity. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, uh, what um, people are seeing out there in, in the literature is you can improve the spatial resolution by a factor of two or better, right? So with a, a low density measurement, you know, with a 30 millimeter, source detector separation, your spatial resolution is gonna be no better than your source detector separation, 30 millimeters. Um, but so with, when you have overlapping measurements, you can push that spatial resolution to 15 millimeters, maybe even 10 millimeters in the adult cortex close to the skull. So <clears throat> we wanted, we started off in 2005 trying to do high density measurements. So we took our fifth generation um, imaging system which had 16 sources, 32 detectors, um, and we set up um, this hexagonal pattern. Um, so we had to time multiplex and, um, and, and frequency encode our sources. Um, and the reason we had to time multiplex was, so for instance, um, this detector 12, um, you know, it's close to source four, it's getting a large signal. So there'd be no way detector 12 could see the long separation source five at the same time as the short separation source four, just the dynamic range was not good enough. So we, ha we had to time multiplex the system so that long separation detectors only saw long separation sources um, at a given time. Right, and likewise, short separation only saw short separation. So we used a hexagonal pattern because we could multiplex through all sources in three different states, um, as opposed to a grid pattern where we'd have to use eight or nine different states. So the duty cycle would be less. Um, so we very much enjoyed this high duty cycle um, to switch through <clears throat> all the different sources. So we did phantom tests. Um, I'll talk about the image reconstruction in a little bit. Um, so, you know, we have this hexagonal array that gives us overlapping measurements. We can put an absorbing target um, uh, underneath the sources and detectors. We can reconstruct it just using the nearest neighbor or the second nearest neighbor. Now in the second nearest neighbor, you see the blob gets larger just because the source detector separation is larger. Right, but if we use both the nearest and second nearest neighbor, we get a much better high resolution image of the absorbing target. So we can move that target around to different locations and pretty much see the same effect. Here's an example where the target is moved to a location where the nearest neighbor measurements don't see it, right? Because the nearest neighbor measurements don't have uniform spatial sensitivity. But when we have the um, overlapping second nearest neighbor measurements, we can see it. Um, and then when we put everything together, we, we get better spatial resolution, right? So, you know, this phantom measurement nicely kind of demonstrates benefits of using overlapping multi-distance measurements because it gives you better spatial um, uniform sensitivity. And in your image reconstruction, you get better um, image resolution, okay? <clears throat> um, so, in that first effort in 2005, we also did some human measurements. This was a, two, um, a brief um, finger tapping, um, I believe. Might have been a, an electrical stimulation. Um, see, this is very short, but I think it was finger tapping. Anyway, so here's the shortest separation. <clears throat> you have to forgive me, it was 17 years ago. Um, here, um, 
is the image reconstruction of the activation at the peak from the nearest neighbor, the second nearest neighbor only. And when we did the image reconstruction using all the measurements, you know, we, we got better spatial resolution. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we, that was 2005, I think the paper was 2006. We tried and tried and tried to do more of those measurements. With our system, it was just not easy um, for various reasons. The, the still the duty cycle between the different states um, took us about a second, maybe half a second. Uh, and so we didn't have good measures of the cardiac cycle. So that was very upsetting to us. So we couldn't really assess signal quality very well. Um, and also our detectors were kind of big, so we couldn't get them, our, our fibers were big, so we couldn't get them close enough. So the, I would really prefer the second nearest neighbor measurement to be 30 millimeters away, but I, I think the best we could do was like 36 millimeters. And so just SNR was poor um, for that larger separation. Um, but then Joe Culver um, and his group, you know, a few years later, you know, they developed um, a special purpose system um, with a grid geometry that gave very nice high density measurements, right? So I think it was 2007. Uh, and they showed um, retina topy with that. Um, and, you know, they've been publishing just lots of papers the last 15 years with their high density system. And they had this really nice paper in 2014 um, in Nature Photonics, where they kind of wrapped their high density probe around um, the whole head. So great work. Um, but other than that group, you know, really very few groups, if any others, really have been doing high density measurements. Um, I mean, that has changed, I guess, the last couple of years um, as now uh, new, more systems become available for, for it. Um, but it's really only the last couple of years. Um, so now pause, two slides, and just tell you how we do the image reconstruction. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> forgive the equations. Um, they're actually, if you just bear with me, they're kind of simple. Um, basically, we measure a perturbation in the optical signal, um, the photon fluence um, between a source and detector. And that perturbation in the signal is coming from a change in the absorption coefficient that's happening because of brain activity. So this delta here represents the change in the absorption coefficient at some position in the brain. Right? We then um, we need the sensitivity profile. This is um, the light that's going from the source to the tissue, and then from the tissue to the detector. So that gives us our sensitivity profile, the so-called banana pattern that many of you are familiar with. And it's the overlap of that banana pattern with the localized change in absorption that gives us the, me the measured change in the intensity. So we can linearize this instead of doing a continuous integral, we could just sum over say voxels in the brain. Um, and then that gives us a linear equation. Um, and then if we have measurements with multiple sources and detectors, um, we get a vector of measurements, Y, right? Where each element in the vector is a measurement with another source and another detector. And we relate that to a vector X, which is the change in the absorption coefficient at every point in the brain. And the matrix that transforms from the image of the absorption changes to the measurements, um, this matrix, it just comes from the photon fluence profiles. Okay, pretty darn simple. So we have this equation, um, linear equation, matrix equation, Y vector equals matrix A times vector X. We measure Y, we calculate A, we wanna solve for the image X. Okay, so you can do that as a least square solution. So any sort of linear equation, you can get a least square solution. It would just be this. But, you know, generally for diffuse optical tomography, you have way more voxels unknowns than you have measurements. So you have an underdetermined inverse problem. Um, also, it's ill-conditioned. So you're highly sensitive to noise. Noise will produce in the measurements will produce large noise in the image. So we need to use regularization. Um, so two common ways of doing regularization. One is a truncated singular value decomposition. So any of you who remember linear algebra maybe are familiar with singular value decomposition. I'm not gonna go into that. Here's the most common way of doing image reconstruction. 
you introduce regularization. So um, <clears throat> we write um, the inverse we're getting now, we have the A, A transpose here. That's the set measurement sensitivity profile, but we can do a spatial regularization um, basically, we're providing provi prior information about where we expect um, the image to be and, and how big the, we expect the image to be. And you can also provide prior information about the covariance in the measurements themselves. Okay, so there's many different ways of setting this prior information in this R and this C matrix and many papers on that. I'm not going to go into the details of that, okay, but this is the general form of how we get our image X from our measurements Y, given our measurement sensitivity profile A, which we calculate using uh, Monte Carlo simulations of photon migration through the head. Okay, so um, as I said, you know, we kind of demonstrated our first adult human high density brain activation in 2005, 2006. Um, but then, you know, we pushed and pushed and pushed and we just couldn't get more experimental measurements. Um, um, but we did develop a lot of code for it. Um, and um, we investigated uh, questions like, well, how much does your spatial resolution improve um, if you use overlapping measurements? And um, well, do you do better if you use um, a subject's true brain anatomy that you can get them from an MRI? Well, man, what if you don't have the subject's true brain anatomy? Can you use a brain atlas? So we did, we wrote a few papers investigating those questions. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, we did a, a number of studies where we had uh, the subject's MRI, we did our diffuse optical tomography measurements, <clears throat> we registered the positions of the probe on the subject's head, <clears throat> we could do the image reconstruction on the subject's true anatomy, but we could also take a brain atlas, register it to that subject's head, and do the image reconstruction on the brain atlas and ask the question, well, how, how much worse is the spatial localization of the image if we don't use the subject's true anatomy? <clears throat> okay, so you know we need to calculate our sensitivity um, matrix. Um, and Chin Chin Fang wrote this wonderful GPU accelerated Monte Carlo code. So we like to use that, it's crazy fast. Um, so we use that in Atlas Viewer. Um, we also have a CPU version, but it's like a 500 times slower. Um, uh, so that's just a plug for Chin Chin and his great work. As the first investigation, we had some um, four seconds of median nerve stimulation. Uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we had that simultaneous fMRI and uh, FNIR. So we actually knew where the brain activation was from uh, fMRI. Um, but here's, here's showing the image reconstructed on the subject's true anatomy. And here's the image reconstructed on the brain atlas, right? So we did that actually for three different subjects um, on the subject's true anatomy and on the atlas, and we can look at the overlap. And generally there's very good overlap, right? Um, so we can ask, well, is the activation on the same gyrus? So free surfer tools are common tools in fMRI from MGH, um, you know, we can, look at the um, image reconstruction on the brain, but then we can inflate the brains to better see the localization on the gyrus versus the sulcus is deeper in the brain. We don't actually have optical sensitivity deep in the sulcus, so we never reconstruct the images there. It's always on the crown of um, the gyri. And so we can say, well, are these on the same gyrus? And indeed, mostly they are. Okay, so this was just three subjects, but we wanted to validate this on in a simulation study on 30, so we, uh, of 30 subjects. So we took a database of 30 anatomical MRIs and we simulated measurements of brain activity um, using a whole head probe. So we, we designed this hexagonal high density probe that covered the whole head. Um, um, and actually, I mean, this was the old way of, of, of how we did it, but um, uh, I'll, I'll show you at the end of this hour, um, kind of our new way of designing probes. But given that probe geometry that's been wrapped onto the head, we then run the Monte Carlo simulations, get the photon sensitivity uh, to the brain. This is kind of showing you the measurement sensitivity for that whole head probe across three of the 30 subjects that we have. <clears throat> and you can see there's actually quite a bit of variability between subjects, right? This is because the 
brain anatomy is different, the skull thickness is different, right? So the distance from the, the top of the scalp to the um, surface of the brain is different between different subjects, right? So this, this, these differences in brain sensitivity are going to impact the measurements you make between subjects, um, even if you place the probes in the exact same locations on each subject, right? So then um, we could uh, place simulated brain activations at different locations. Um, and because of FreeSurfer basically does this, it can transform locations between different brains using the fingerprint of the gyral folding pattern. So this location corresponds to that location, corresponds to that location. We know they're the same anatomical locations in the different brains. Um, so we simulate activation in each different location. Um, we then, um, that's this, we reconstruct an image in the subject space and we reconstruct an image in the registered atlas space, right? And so we can, we know the true location of the of where the uh, activation should be, we then calculate the location that it's been reconstructed in the subject space and the location has been reconstructed in the atlas space, and then we can calculate in this case a localization error we get. Right. So we look at just the Euclidean localization error, which is just the distance in three D space between the true activation and the reconstructed activation, and so this is just showing you results for three different subjects. So actually, we do this. For an activation at one location at a time, but then we move the activation to every location on the surface of the head. It's a simulation, right? So we can do that. Um, so this shows you kind of the localization error that you get as a function of location of the activation for different subjects. And on average, you see when we reconstruct um, the brain activation on the, um, right now I'm a little confused on the subject's true um, anatomy. Wait, forgive me, I'm a little confused. I think this is reconstructed on the atlas space, right? So we're reconstructing in the atlas. So this is not the subject's true anatomy. Um, we have on average a localization of error of about 17 millimeters. Actually, when we go across all 30 subjects, the average localization was 18 millimeters. <clears throat> That's Euclidean distance. You can also look at geodesic distance, which actually follows the contour of the surface of the brain. So if the true activation is on one gyrus and you reconstruct it on another gyrus, the Euclidean distance could be short, but the geodesic distance would be long, right? So what you see is on average, the geodesic localization error is larger than the Euclidean makes sense because oftentimes they're reconstructing the brain activation on a neighboring gyrus, right? <clears throat> so. Um, so here's, here's kind of the summary image of all 30 subjects. Uh, you can see the localization error in 3D space and on the geodesic space, we'll ignore that. Um, and we got our 18 millimeters versus 30 millimeters. If you use the subject's true anatomy, you see that your localization error halves, right? So if you have the subject's true MRI, you can do a much better job localizing brain activity um, with FMIRS, right? Take home message. Um, but nonetheless, if you don't have the subject's true anatomy, you can still do quite well with your localization of the brain activation using the Atlas um, uh, MRI. That's using the Atlas brain template. Okay. Um, so, at, um, right. <clears throat> so all of those tools for that uh, image analysis, we then put into uh, Atlas Viewer. Um, and, and so we use that for reconstructing images of our F, from our FMIRS data, right? So we, we start off with Homer doing the temporal processing to estimate our HRF. Um, and then we take the output from Homer and we put it in an Atlas viewer to produce our images of brain activation. <clears throat> um, we also use Atlas viewer to design our probes, right? To target specific uh, brain regions. So, um, <clears throat> you know, as I said, we set out to get high density um, FNIRS measurements you know, um, 20 years ago uh, in adults, almost 20 years ago. We kind of failed to do it, um, but finally the last um, um, 
last year we we have succeeded um and and that's in <clears throat> entirely due um to alex who you know as he said he um worked with us um at, at, at in boston for um two years 2018 to 2020 then he went um back to berlin um worked with nirex and he <clears throat> encouraged me to try out um the near sport too um so they sh um, sh shipped me a a, a a system to demo um I think, uh, by december 2020 uh and so first thing i did um after opening it up and testing it to make sure it got signals i then wanted to I, I it was the first actually the first thing i tried to do with it uh it was over the christmas holidays i wanted to try a high density measurement so i actually i designed this probe in atlas viewer i'm going to show you how to do that today um i then actually printed a ninja cap that's what we do in my lab was we 3d print these caps to place optodes at the exact locations we design in atlas viewer um these are the um optode holders from from Mirax that I then place the optodes into with the spring tops. Um, and um, th this was my first measurement. I think it was like the day after Christmas in 2020. Uh, and um, and this was, I did like two five minute runs of finger tapping, um, maybe eight different trials each, 16 trials maybe. And this was the first image of brain activation I got within the New York system. And so this was a high density system. So I was, I was super excited that we were able to do that, um, particularly given how many years we had failed doing it with my prior emission system. So that was very, very exciting. So now what we wanna do is actually increase the number of sources and detectors. So, you know, we could do that with Mirax <clears throat> where you can combine four systems together, that will give you 64 sources, 64 detectors. Actually, maybe you can combine five systems, so 80 and 80. But um, I I, uh, I want to get like, a, I don't want balanced sources, balanced detectors. I want to get um, 108 detectors, 36 sources to cover the whole head. I like using my hexagonal pattern. Um, so we've, we've already prototyped the headgear. So the headgear fits on head very nicely. Now we just have to build the electronics. And so that's something we have a brain initiative kind of we're working on to build the electronics to drive all of these uh, optodes. But we want to get this whole head covered. So one question, why 36 sources, 108 detectors? Remember, I, I was telling you about this simulation study. This had basically that many sources and detectors. You have three times as many detectors as sources. In a grid geometry, you have the same number of sources and detectors. And so there's, there's slight advantages A grid geometry will give you um, uh, incrementally better spatial resolution because it's giving you more overlapping measurements. Um, but the hexagonal pattern really allows you to cover the whole head with a smaller um, number of sources for one and detectors as well. Um, um, and you get, um, you still get a dramatic improvement in spatial resolution. Um, and because you have fewer sources, you know, um, fewer optodes, the system has less weight and better battery life and you know a better duty cycle. So I still have preferences myself to a um, hexagonal probe. Um, okay, so um, at this point, I could show you how to design a probe. Is that the next thing for us to do, Alex? I think it is. Yeah, sure, David. All right, so, whoops. I realize I'm not sharing the right stuff. I'm going to switch to MATLAB now. Um, and I'm going to run Atlas Viewer. So you see MATLAB, right? Yes. All right. So I've um, <clears throat> everything I'm going to show you is in, uh, will work if you get the master version of Atlas Viewer right now from GitHub. Um, it, um, this stuff doesn't fully work with the prior release. We're, we're about to make a new release. So those of you who only use the release, you'll be able to do it soon. So I've already set paths for Atlas Viewer. Um, I'm running Atlas Viewer. I'm gonna run it in this blank directory. <clears throat> so sorry, I, I'm not introducing you to the basics of Atlas Viewer. <clears throat> we have, if, 
you go to our website, um, openfnears.org, um, you can find lots of documentation on Homer and Atlas Viewer. Um, and, uh, uh, and tutorials as well. Okay, so I have this picture here. This is the probe I want to design. So, you know, I've drawn this on a piece of paper, say, but now I want to get it onto the head, All right? So I can, you know, I, I can say, well, I want to look at the left side of the head. I also want to see my 1020 locations. So I say, display the reference points and zoom in, you know, tilt it a little bit. So I know the motor cortex for finger tapping is gonna be around C3. So I, I wanna kind of drop this probe right on C3. Uh, and so I'm gonna put it right around here. So I have to design that. So I'm gonna say probe, I wanna create a probe in Atlas Viewer. We had an old way of doing it in a 2D space, but um, this is now the modern way of doing it. Um, in Atlasphere itself, it opens up this create edit probe panel. So I can add optodes. Um, so I'm gonna add sources just by clicking. So I've done this many times. So I, I know what I'm doing. Um, when you're doing it the first time, it will take a little longer. So I just click on the brain, place the source there, there, um, that was this source and that source. Now I'm going to do these three sources and then those final two sources. And then I'm going to add all the detectors. Okay, so I'll come back. So let me put this three sources and then two more. Now I'm going to switch to detectors. So again, I refer to my drawing. And again, I've done it many times. So. Um, I know where the detectors roughly go. So right now I'm just kind of roughly placing where they go. And then I'm gonna go in and make sure the distances are um, precise, okay? But initially I don't worry about precise distances because I'm gonna fix that later, okay? So you can see basically now I've got this arrangement of sources and detectors that pretty much matches my drawing. Right, um, and um, but it's it's on the surface of the head, right? So if, if I were to zoom around, you can see those are on the surface of the head, right? Um, and relative to the ten twenty points I've I've chosen <clears throat> to I, um, to make now I want to start adjusting distances, but to facilitate adjusting distances, we need three anchor points. Um, so you, you, because if we don't anchor, have anchor points, the probe can actually start wandering all over the head as we start fixing distances. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, I wanna edit some optodes now. I'm gonna click near this guy um, because I want this guy to be anchored at CP5, okay? Um, so that guy is now anchored at CP5. I am... Um, I can't anchor any other optodes because I need, as I fix, as I change distances, I need the probe to kind of move around. So I, I need to create some dummy optodes. So I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna add some dummy optodes. I'm gonna put a dummy optode up there. I'm gonna put a dummy optode over here. See, they're kind of magenta colored. I'm gonna edit those and I'm gonna, click that guy, it's just warning me there's no measurement, that's, that's fine. So I select this guy, I wanna anchor that dummy up to it at CZ. I'm gonna click over here. I'm not clicking the number, I'm clicking next to the number. So um, if I click the number, I don't get the call back. So I just click next to the number. So now I've selected dummy up to two and I want that guy to be anchored at F3, okay. Um, now I'm going to start fixing distances. Um, so I need, um, I need I, those dummy optodes. I need springs attaching those dummy optodes to all the other optodes, right? So when I was, um, maybe before I do that, let me just get out of this. So I originally, you know, had, um, when we were 
plopping all the sources and detectors down on the head, we were automatically generating um, measurements. We basically, as optodes that were between a distance or sources and detectors within zero to 30 millimeters, we're automatically creating measurement channels. Um, but we also, we use springs to help us control the distances between optodes. And likewise, any optodes within zero and 30 were springs were automatically connecting them. Okay, so we're gonna be adjusting those springs to get the distances we want. So first thing I have to do is I need to make sure my dummy optodes <coughs> have springs. So I've selected this dummy optode, it has no springs. Um, I say, I wanna edit that. And I just double, I uh, right click. And now I've added that spring. So now I'm gonna go over here, no spring. So I right click over here and I've added a spring there. Now these are, these, these are just anchored dummy optodes to help give the orientation of the probe. So I don't care about the distance. So because I don't care about the distance, I'm gonna put a, a negative one, right? So I'm here, a negative one. That just means I don't care about the distance, okay? So now I've anchored my probe in three different locations. And now because I've, I've anchored it three different locations, I can register it, which is gonna fix the distances according to the lengths I've specified. I haven't changed any lengths, so this is gonna do not, nothing um, to my probe, but I just click it to make sure everything works and everything does work. So now you know, I can go in and check all my distances. And so I do that by, I, um, I click a source <clears throat> and this shows me the measurement list. So I've got four nearest neighbor measurements. Here's a second nearest neighbor measurement. And according to my drawing, I need another second nearest neighbor measurement there. So I just right click over there. Now I can, I can see the distances and um, I need to adjust the distances. So I know from my drawing, short should be 17.6 and long should be 30 millimeters, right? So I just, I go in and start editing that. So this goes fast. So those are the four short and then I've got two long separation. Okay. So, you know, I've, I've adjusted that. I could register the probe again um, and it, you'll see things move ever so slightly, right? But now I, I'm gonna do this for all of the measurement channels. So this source, it only gave me the nearest neighbor. Well, I know there's also a second nearest neighbor there and there. And so now I need to, again to go edit the distances. See, I plopped it down, it was 36. I want it to be 30, right? So just clicking, you don't get the distances right, but I was pretty close. But now I can make the distances you know, precise. So I could register again, and you'll see they change slightly based on the distances. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go through all of them now. You know, this has a long separation there, there, and there. And so I just need to adjust the distances. Um, I'll just go through all of them. So this has no long separation measurements. So I have to add all of them. I'm just right clicking to add them. Oops, come back here. <clears throat> just bear with me, this goes pretty fast. Okay, um, I add those measurements. You can see some of those distances are just way too long. So good thing we're going in here to fix this stuff. Okay, just a few more. Just long separation, long separation. Uh, 
last time. Okay, so now we can register our probe. Did I register? Register. Okay. So it's all registered. I can stop editing and I can show you the final. All right. So that's our final probe. So I <clears throat> actually, so what we're going to, the data that Yuan Yuan collected was actually a bilateral high density probe. So she did this on the left hemisphere as well as the right hemisphere. Um, and I think she's collected over 10 subjects of data. Um, and so what I'll show you next time is the analysis of um, those uh, data. Uh, but importantly, what's really cool is you can now take the output from your probe design here. Um, you get a, a SNRF file that has the probe geometry and um, you can take that SNRF file and bring it into Nearsight. And um, your site will then uh, know the probe geometry. So I think you guys have a video showing how that's done. Indeed. Um, Amy, if you could play that. Or I'm maybe. on it. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, hello everyone. Uh, I hope everyone is having a good time at the webinar there. Uh, I'm here for a demo hands-on part. Um, and I am uh, with Dr. Yuan Yuan Gao and Decha Roger from the BU um, FNIRS lab. Um, and we're gonna show today how to uh, import the high density uh, montage that you can create in Atlas Viewer. How do you import this into the near site and then you can use in Aurora. So let's see um, a bit step by step here how, how to do that and then we'll show you how to get some signals in Aurora. Thank you very much, Dr. Gal. Um, please continue. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so here I will say the first step we would do is to go into the Alice Weaver test in your uh, MATLAB and set the path. Um, in Alice Weaver so that we can add the path of Alice Weaver to um, MATLAB searching paths. Um, that will take a few seconds um, to finish. Okay. After that, um, the path of Alice Weaver should be added to the searching path of um, MATLAB. So then we can go to the path of a fo the folder where we store our SD file. And then we can bring up Alice Weaver um, GUI. And then by doing that, Alice Weaver would automatically read the SD file in the same path we are currently, okay. currently at. And then it will automatically create two folders and also a new SD file and a new SNRF file. So the SNRF file will uh, store all the prop information we have and then can be directly imported into um, near site. Um, so when we first read in all the information from our SD file, the probes probably not attached to the surface surface of our head model, so that we can click this button, register prop to surface, and then Alice we were will attach all the uh, props onto the surface of the head model we have here. Um, so it will be, it will look like this. And that part should be good in Alice River. And then the SNRF file should have all the information we need to import into a near site. 
So after that, we can open near site software. And then in near site GUI here, we can click the button of import. And the first option is import from, and then we change it to register position from SD or SNR file. And then we can click the button load coordinates and register. And then we go to the same folder where we were at in Alice River. And then we can click on the SNR file, which is automatically created in uh, Alice River. And then we can open this SNR file. And then near sites will read all the information in that SNR file and load the prop information into um, the head model it has. Okay, after it's done, we can close this GUI and we can see that um, our bilateral model region high density prop um, is already loaded here. Um, so that we can we don't we can directly um, use this prop to collect data. Um, so after that, we can save this uh, imported prop to, um, we can save it to for Aurora or we can save it to a separate file. Mm -hmm. um, I will name it as um, high density demo here and save. And then in Aurora, we can create a new configuration. And then we can see uh, HD demo here, which is created and we can select this um, prop design. And then we can rename a new configuration file here, this demo. And then this uh, for this prop, we are using two um, near side 16 by 16 devices together. So mm -hmm. I would say we're using two. And we're using accelerometers. So I will check this one. Perfect. And I will say, OK, that's the configuration we're using. And after that, I can select this. Um, So first, we need to connect to the connect the device. <laughs> device. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So our device is already connected to this computer by USB. I can select that device. And then since we have already created a, a new configuration, we can just select this one, HD demo. Okay. Okay, so now all the prop information is loaded in Aurora successfully. So next, Stacia will help me to put the high, um, high density, bilateral high density prop cap on me. So we can show. Perfect. Yeah. So, so you are using the Ninja Nears cap. Yes. The ninja cap. Yes, we're using the ninja cap and we have already built the cap accordingly to the our prop here. So okay. Perfect. Measuring all the the coordinates, positioning the cap. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely very important the correct position of the cap, so mm -hmm. you know you're recording from the correct area. Yeah. 
Okay. the cap okay all right so the cap is on the hat now okay so we can do the signal optimization here Okay, we are not doing a lot of like adjustment here, but we can see like mm -hmm. already most of the channels are like uh, greenish or uh, yellow. Um, so that's good, but um, usually what we do is that we adjust every channel to make our best to make okay. them um, green. And then, um, so for a demo, I, will, I wouldn't waste time on that. So <laughs> next, um, after the optimization, we can start, go to the next tab and we can start the recording. And you can put your experimental information there and then you can start the recording. And then here's all the channels we have and then we can see how the signal looks like. And you can see just a few channels are, are, are bad with, uh, yeah. with no preparation at all. Yes. Good. Sounds really so, good. Can you check the line plots just to, just to see the... Oh, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So in some yeah. channels, you can easily see the cardio signal. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty good, I would say. Um, yeah. Without any adjustment, just one shot. <laughs> OK. Exactly. Yeah. And also so, with your with your hair, which is pretty pretty dark. Yeah. Yes. Harder for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I think yeah, that's no that's that was a very informative and easy demo to get from Atlas Viewer directly to to the recording part. Thank yeah. That's a, yeah. No problem. <laughs> Is there any tips or, or tricks that you will, you will, you think it's, you know, with the high density probes, you know, for the preparation, um, mm -hmm. is there anything that you would like to, to give or, or to give some uh, tips for the, for the audience uh, with the, um, the high density? So um, for the high, high density? Yeah, for getting the, getting good signals. Getting good signal. Um, you usually just do a little bit of, of wiggling and then that's that's uh, yeah good. We, will, we will do like a general like movement of okay. the whole cap and then we will um look at the uh, signal quality in this plot mm -hmm. and then we'll adjust accordingly to the okay. signal quality with with a like a q-tip mm -hmm. um, and also i would suggest uh definitely have a, a like a black shower cap that would definitely okay. help. Yeah, um, cool. because that will uh, block a lot of like environment light uh, from the lab in uh, lab space. So, from the dark, yeah. Yeah, so that's very important. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's my best suggestion. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. You are, you are. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Deisha, for your help there as well with the cap. <laughs> Yeah. Bye. Bye. All right, we are back live. That was that was interesting, uh, David. If you want to add anything, um, everybody is always so yeah. curious I about how to get good signal quality, and high density might scare some people. So, if you have anything to add. Uh, you and you and did all the the measurements. You know, I'll show you the results next week, and it it um for for that probe geometry, it wasn't actually much harder than a low density. I'd say. 
um, okay. the, you know, the spring tops um, and wiggling and the spring tops and you can wiggle individual optodes gets you mm. pretty far. And worst comes to worst, you can pick under, you know, um, troublesome optodes with a, a, a Q-tip. Right. Absolutely. I'm usually the guinea pig here in Berlin, yeah. but now yeah. you see Gio on screen. He's the new one. Yeah. Glad to have him <laughs> to do all the testing. Awesome. Um, thanks so much for, for really the first part, which was very interesting. A um, lot of new things in that. And I guess, um, you know, that's, that's where we will see future FNIRs to move, probably. We, we do have some questions. Um, from the audience, if you still have any questions, anything really, um, then this is your chance. Um, please feel free to write in the chat. Um, I will start, David, with the, with the questions that were submitted during the registration. And as we get more from the chat, we will add there. Um, the first one is really a very general one. Um, please explain the benefit slash cost of utilizing whole brain probe coverage versus an ROI based probe placement? Oh, I mean, that, you know, that just depends on the question you're going after. Um, you know, the more oftentimes, you know, you want to measure many brain regions and to do that, you need, you know, more sources, more detectors. So that is mm -hmm. certainly a downside of high density is you need even more sources and detectors. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> So I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it depends on your specific questions you're, ask, you're asking. Mm. There's, there's a related one. Um, so I will ask it now. And it says, and this is an expansion of the question, which says, um, curious to hear your thoughts on having optoed coverage beyond my brain regions of interest. So what are the advantages of looking at yeah. brain regions outside the scope of my experimental design? Sure. Sure. No. And yeah, perfect. Thanks for combining those two questions. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, right. So if I would say it's always good to push both to high density, if you can, you know, it's, it's, which just means you need a bigger system. It's going to give you much better spatial uniformity. Right. So that is a big deal. You, you get better spatial resolution, but the biggest deal is spatial uniformity. Right. Mm -hmm. So, which will just give you such better high, high quality data across all your subjects, right? So in some subjects, you, you, you may have poor responses simply because your probe uniformity wasn't good, whereas high density removes that issue away, right? Now, as for measuring other brain regions, it's always nice to have controls, <clears throat> measurements, right? To have brain regions where you do not expect um, any brain responses. Um, and so that can help mm. you a lot with interpretation of your results um, and, and higher order analyses, right? So, you know, I, I really hope that just the price of adding more optos is going to come down and everyone can just have, cover more brain regions with high density. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, and I guess when you have the whole head thing, then of course you remove the intersubject placement um variance a bit if everyone does whole head do, do you improve on that do you still need to digitize <clears throat> i think i mean we always work very hard to position our caps relative to the main 1020 landmarks right so um as you saw them doing in the video mm -hmm. demo there they you know they were finding cz and the cap had cz marked on it right and, and it, it kind of had the center lines um, mm -hmm. front and back marked as well so they could get everything perfectly centered right so you you always want to take those steps mm -hmm. it, okay <clears throat> all right um slightly different one would be great to know if there's any way to get depth information while simulating sensitivity of probe design yeah I, so for sure the Oh, maybe I misunderstood the question. I'll answer the question I thought it was, and then the question I think it is. So for sure, having high density measurements allows you to do depth discrimination between scalp and brain. And so that's very useful. Um, um, depth resolution within the brain, I think is very challenging. Um, but I think the question was more about getting depth sensitivity yeah. um, from, right. So, and so that's like an Atlas viewer specific question. You can do that. 
Um, you absolutely can do that. I, uh, you know, uh, John Spencer years ago pushed us to add that for one of his projects. It is documented somewhere and I, I, I can't remember where it's documented. So I would it, <clears throat> encourage you to go to our forum at openfnews.org and post that question there because it, it should be documented in the forum would be a great place to discuss it. So other people in the future who have that question can find the information. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and to, just my curiosity, when you said you could you could could have a depth differentiation, so to say, uh, with that you meant between physiology and brain, right? So, so more, yeah, more the systemic shock. physiology and the scalp, you could discriminate from um, the brain activation in the brain. Okay, all right, makes sense. Okay, then I'll take some from um, that came during the webinar. And I, I don't want to put anyone on spot, but please, you are feel uh, feel free to just unmute uh, yourself um, and yeah, ask your questions it, directly. There is a question in the chat I can answer. Is there any reason not to add short distance channels or was that only for practical reasons where there are no um, source detector channels available for the demo? So, you know, <laughs> um, the the source detect the source the short channels are very nice on the NSP2, um, but when we go to high density, it makes that probe very stiff, you know, because we're getting everything much closer together. So so Yuan Yuan, you know, she's now writing up her study of like twelve subjects doing the bilateral motor task. She did not use the short channels there, mm -hmm. um, but because we kind of had a bilateral probe and many channels we are exploring taking the average of all of the short channels, which mind you are 18 millimeter separations. Um, and so we're taking the average of all those 18 millimeter channels to act as a short channel. Okay. Um, and also from the webinar, why is maximum likelihood generally used for image reconstruction rather than SVD? Um, because it provides you a a, a well-defined way of adding priors. Um, it, it kind of, the maximum likelihood, it, it also kind of can be interpreted within the Bay, Bayesian inference model. And so that R matrix and C matrix gives you a very principled statistical way of adding prior information to improve the quality of your image reconstruction. Right, whereas the SVD, you know, it's very simple to do, but it, it doesn't give you more knobs to add prior information. All right. Um, another one is, and by the way, David, everybody thanks you for, for, mm -hmm. for taking the time to, to share your research. So, okay. One more, thank you for the interesting presentation. My question is, can we change the montage a posteriori? For example, we perform some measurements with the montage slash configuration, and then actually we realize we can adjust the 3D coordinates of the actual montage on Atlas Viewer can be updated after the acquisition. Um, I, wait, let me maybe ask a mm. different question. Or maybe what they're asking, or maybe they should just speak. You know, they designed it in their site and now they want to update it in Atlas Viewer. Is that what you're asking? I think it's directed in that, this yeah. direction. One of our yeah. users, so it has to be <clears> their <throat> site. Um, well, I mean, if, if Nearsight could export a SNR file, then absolutely, right? Um, it, but it exports I, the, the DIGPTS file, right? the text file with all the 3D coordinates, which can then be used in Atlas Viewer. Maybe that would work. <laughs> Something to maybe try. We explored this together. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I think we are reaching to to some very narrow specific questions, and I think we'll get in touch with Wait, the users so directly. Sergio asked yeah. for the reconstruction. Which data do you usually use? Optical density, intensity, or hemoglobin concentrations? Um, optical density is what I use, right? So we we um right we we typically use the optical density measurements, and then reconstruct um, hemoglobin concentrations. And there's papers describing that. 
Okay. We're, we're actually trying to follow Adam Egerbrick and and um, and Joe Culver. We're trying to follow their reconstruction methods since they put so much effort into them. And then Lin Yang asked, do you think that frequency based F meters will improve the depth sensitivity and spatial resolution? Um, uh, maybe. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I'm not thinking much about that. I, I guess Hamid Degani is, is pushing that some more, um, but I, I haven't thought about it in over 10, 15 years, sorry. Right. I worry because the SNR is going to be worse. So I really like to have high SNR. Um, and CW systems must have much better SNR. Okay. Okay. I'm curious. I'm, I don't think I fully understand this, but we could give it a shot. I'm curious from the equipment side, are you proposing high density by simply adding cap slots slash optodes yeah no i think maybe maybe new x was surprised because the first thing i did with it was a high density and, and i you know i i, I um i and it was out of the box high density right so all i did was make that cap and put the optodes closer together i think that's yeah. what the question is right yeah so the, nothing, yeah right nothing special I mean, ninja nears, the, the cap is special. The yeah. cap, right, the cap. I mean, you could do that with an easy cap. You could certainly, you know, cut your holes to be closer with the easy cap. All right. Okay. Um, then for, uh, yeah, I think <laughs> for a multimodal setup, for example, EGF nears, how feasible is it to have whole head coverage in both modalities? Slightly off topic. Yeah, well, I mean, so we're working on that. So we we have a, in our lab just just recently a very nice prototype LED that actually works with the New York system um, that fits inside the hole of an active electrode. Um, so that's going to make it very feasible to do a whole head FNIRS EEG. Of course, you need a whole head Fner system. So that's a lot of optodes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I give a little bit of pause because I, we haven't yet tried high density Fners with EEG. I have to think about how big that active electrode is. That may make it challenging to get optodes within 18 millimeters of each, each other. I haven't thought about that yet. I need to go try mm -hmm. that. Indeed. Okay, I will take one from the chat. What is the maximum temporal resolution you get with any modern FNIR system in milliseconds or seconds? No, I mean, in, I mean, you could push it to kilohertz or even higher if you wanted. I think though, anyone measuring hemodynamic signals is perfectly mm -hmm. happy with a 10 hertz um, uh, sampling frequency. Um, and you know that allows you to do temporal multiplexing, so you could you know have many overlapping measurements. <laughs> okay, um, I think I will take one more. Uh, sort of know the answer of that. Would it make sense to add longer channels to get deeper information from the brain? Uh, sorry, I was reading something. What did you say? Yeah. Would it make sense to add longer channels to get deeper information from uh, the brain? Um, sure. And so, and, and you know, Adam Agrabrick and Joe Culver, they've demonstrated that. Um, uh, and so that, that does give you incrementally better spatial resolution, right? Um, and so we could try that. Um, I, I, <clears throat> with an 18 millimeter near separation in a hexagonal pattern, I forget what the third separation would be, but I, I would worry about the signal quality. So one thing mm. I'm thinking about in my head is I'm trying to get the nearest neighbor down to 12 millimeters. And then in that case, like the fourth nearest neighbor is still 36 millimeters away. So we could have a lot of overlapping measurements in the hexagonal pattern then, but we mm. have to make the optoids smaller to get to them to within 12 millimeters of each other. All right. Okay, let's, okay, now a few more in the chat. Uh, 
this, um, you use fMRI as ground truth for FNIRs. Are we expecting to have an exact correspondence between fMRI map and NIR since they don't exactly measure the same thing? Bold versus HPO, sure, sure, HPO. right. So, I mean, when, when I was talking, I'm sorry if I said fMRI, we're, we're using MRI anatomy as a ground truth anatomy versus a, a representative head atlas anatomy. I didn't use any functional ground truth information. However, we do have many papers from 15, 20 years ago that did look at exactly those questions. So mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. All right. Um, last two, is there any development in terms of a common regularization approach for multimodal tomographic approaches? FNIRS plus DCS slash TD NIRS. Hmm. Not sure if I understand. No, I, under, I understand. No, okay. I understand. Um, uh, I think you could find some stuff in the literature, maybe not exactly in the image reconstruction domain, but in, in like the single channel domain, but you know, interesting ideas there definitely okay um then one final one if the probe has scs which i assume is short channels short channels yeah that overlap with long channels the sc regression comes along with the reconstruction yeah. i mean we would not need to do the sc regression yeah as a right so we'll so you on you on is actually a, a, a you know, addressing that question. And actually, if you go back to, you know, an old paper, again, from Joe Cover's group, um, they actually asked the question, if I do a high density image reconstruction with or without first doing short separation regression, you know, does the image quality get better? And they showed that it does get better if you do the two-step process, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and with Yuan Yuan's data set, which, you know, next month we'll look at, she found the same thing that, you know, yes, you, the image reconstruction alone, um, if you reconstruct scalp versus brain, does a really good job of removing the systemic physiology, but you can get even better results if you do short separation regression, as well as the tom tomography between scalp and brain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. But, but Sergio is right, actually, the, the tomography of scalp versus brain is really good. So you, you don't really need to do short separation regression in that case, but it does get incrementally better if you do. All right. There are a few more specific questions, but we will answer that directly. Um, yeah, thanks so much. I would actually yeah. ask Alex for, for any last words um, and then, yeah. The one last point I would like to make, as David mentioned, we will analyze this data on March 9th in, in a second webinar. So please do join us for the, for the second part, if you can. From my side, also, also not, not too much to add, except a big thank you, David, again, and um, really looking forward to see the analysis results in the next webinar. And um, yeah, we mentioned briefly that, uh, well, I mean, while you used the optodes, basically the way that the system and the software already work for uh, high density successfully, there is some things that can be tweaked um, to improve dynamic range and sample rate and so on. That's something we're working on that we'll you know, also uh, hopefully next webinar will maybe disclose a bit more um, and uh, you know, in terms of software. So uh, really, really looking forward to that. Um, and yeah, big, big things again. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks everyone.